All right, hello everybody. Welcome back to Statistics for Linguists. Uh, today we are gonna wrap up our discussion of analysis of variance by talking about our last topic, which is repeated measures, ANOVA. Uh, so without any further ado, because it's taken me a while to get these up, uh, I'm gonna get right into it. Uh, and the way we're gonna get into it is by going back to talk about the uh, assumptions that kind of underlie um, how analysis of variance works. Um, so the, what are the assumptions underlying ANOVA and what can we do if they happen to be violated by our data? It turns out that repeated measures ANOVA is one kind of strategy we can use in a specific situation to help us not have to worry about some of these assumptions. Uh, but just to remind ourselves, uh, the assumptions that we have for ANOVA primarily concern the element of residual variance in our data, because that's the baseline variance against which we're comparing the variance accounted for by other possible structures in the data, um, i.e. the main effects and the interactions. So just remember, uh, when we do an F test, we're comparing the variances of two different groups and the sort of denominator variance is always gonna be that baseline or residual variance, uh, which kind of has to look a particular way in order for this to work. Um, effectively, that residual variance has to be something unpredictable. It's the unpredictable kind of component of the overall variance in your data. So the first part is that it has to be random. Uh, and then the second assumption is that it's normally distributed. We've looked at that before as well. Uh, we also talked about the fact that it has to be equal or at least not significantly different among the groups that you're testing. Uh, so that's actually a lot of assumptions that go into uh, just that one bit of the whole paradigm. Um, and it turns out there's also another assumption, which is that the residual variance is assumed to be the result of independent observations in the data. Um, so that's kind of the fourth uh, dimension here. Uh, but the good news is that ANOVA is very robust, according to many different sources, to violations of the assumption of equality of variance across groups, um, if those groups have equal numbers of observations. So this is going back actually to um, the third assumption here. The fourth assumption is kind of what we're going to be able to play around with by doing uh, repeated measures ANOVA. Uh, but this part um, can kind of be solved if you do have equal num numbers of observations in your groups. I think we looked at that um, a lecture or two ago where we had uh, sort of what appeared to be um, significantly different variances within the uh, factor levels for different stop places of articulation when we're looking at how VOT depends on stop place. Uh, so that could be problematic, but it's apparently solvable if you do have equal numbers of observations in those groups. Um, so this is something to keep in mind during the experimental design phase of your study. Uh, and I'll mention as well, at this point in sort of the our progression through these topics, I'm going to have to get a little bit hand wavy because uh, my background knowledge of the details of why these um, problems are problematic uh, is a little bit sketchy because as I've mentioned before, I'm not uh, an expert in this topic. It's just something I do as part of my own expertise. Uh, so I'm gonna rely on the experts, the actual experts in describing these you know, problems and the resolutions to you. Uh, but for now, you can kind of keep this in mind that if you can balance out your numbers when you're designing your study, that's gonna help you later on in generating useful statistical analysis based on your data. Um, and that's also just a general, normally a good design principle anyways, when you're designing uh, an experiment um, to, you know, make everything equal between different conditions, except for the one thing that you're testing, right? Uh, that being said, there are a couple of other options at your disposal if you know that the ANOVA assumptions are not being met. Uh, and the first of these is called the Kruskal-Wallis test. And I mentioned this a while back, but this is a non-parametric form of ANOVA. Uh, but unfortunately, it only applies to one-way ANOVA. So we kind of lose the possibility to take a look at interactions this way. But uh, it will help us out because it doesn't require any of the assumptions about residual variance that ANOVA makes. Uh, and instead of doing that sort of F test where it compares variances between two different groups, it will compare rank orderings of different groups of data. Uh, normally these non-parametric tests all just kind of like order the data in some sort of rank order and then generate whatever test statistic they need to have based on that alone, that just rank ordering and the specific quantitative differences between the like items in the rank order don't make that much of a difference, uh, which is where they kind of lose their their power, basically, because you're losing some information there. But uh, be that as it may, they still work just fine, no matter what that data looks like. Um, it'll just tell you something different about your data in 
specifically, it's going to tell you about differences between groups of data overall, rather than differences, uh, rather than telling you something about the differences between the means of those groups of data. Um, <clears throat> mentioned this hopefully many times before, but those means of the groups of data can be misleading measures. You know, they can be um, affected by outliers and that sort of thing. Uh, and they're also just kind of reducing the amount of data as well to one specific number for the entire group. Uh, the cross Wallace test kind of gets around that a bit by focusing on just the rank orders of the whole group. Uh, and we'll take a look at how this works with our VOT data for this class. I'll plop that data in here. Um, so just to remind ourselves what this looks like, um, we've just got everybody saying these specific words, which begin with different stops and have all five sort of canonical or cardinal vowels uh, in them. Uh, and then everybody's repeating these three times. Uh, and we measured the VOT of the stop at the beginning of each word. And before we do the kruskal walls test, we can take a look at how, uh, whoops, VOT depends on stop in a one-way ANOVA like this, and we find that it has a significant effect. The place of articulation will affect the amount of VOT you get for any particular uh, production of these stops um, pretty consistently, although it's not obviously totally predictable. We still have some residual variance, right? Well, the kruskal wallace test doesn't really care about that residual variance. Um, it's not going to give you this sort of F-test statistic at all. Uh, instead, it gives you what's called a chi-squared statistic value. In this case, it's 27.822, whatever that means. Uh, the one kind of value we do care about is the p-value. Um, so this is just a different kind of distribution. We're actually going to talk about chi-squared tests um, quite a bit <clears throat> in the last little tail bit of this class. Um, because it underlies a lot of other useful sort of analysis we can do. Uh, but for now, we're not going to worry about it. We'll just say, look, the p-value here is obviously significant. This is a much smaller number than 0.05. So in this case, the kruskal wallace test is telling us that um, stop place of articulation does have a meaningful effect on VOT. Um, yeah, just like our one-way ANOVA did kind of the usual way. Um, right. Uh, for now, I said uh, we aren't going to dig into the details of the chi-square test or the kruskal wallace test. But just know that it works and can kind of work in any sort of situation like this. Um, we need to kind of learn a little bit more about how basic probability works to get a sense of how the underlying mechanics of the chi-square test work. Um, that turns out to be not super complicated, but it takes a while to understand all the details. For now, though, the chi-square tests are suitable for dependent measures which are categorical rather than gradient. Um, so kind of what the kruskal wallace test is probably doing underlyingly is converting um, these raw measures of VOT into something kind of categorically based for each stop. And again, I'm not going to get into the details, but that's where you get um, that sort of chi-squared analysis from. You'll see what I mean later. Uh, don't worry about it for now. Uh, I can also tell you that there is a... Um, Another parametric approach you can use for this sort of data setup, and that's um, to use R's built-in one-way test command. Uh, and this is basically like uh, an ANOVA, except it's kind of applying that Welch correction that we used earlier for t-tests. Uh, I think I mentioned before that uh, ANOVA is just kind of like an expanded t-test, uh, and this one-way test is kind of like an expanded t-test with a Welch correction. Uh, because we can look at more than two levels in any one factor in order to get this to work. So we can run the one-way test with this syntax here. So the only thing I'm changing here really is this bit, and there's other little details, but that's, this is the difference um, in how you run the different tests. In the kruskal wallace test and the one-way test, you specify your data source this way. The model looks the same in all three of these commands. Um, in this last one, you also can specify variance equal is false. Uh, and it's going to spit out the results of an F-test like what we've seen before with the uh, degrees of freedom for the numerator and the denominator. So again, it's dividing the two variances um, by each other, coming up with some sort of ratio, which is this and then generating a p-value based on that ratio. So it's almost exactly the same thing as the original uh, one-way ANOVA, but it's got this sort of variance equal equals false uh, 
correction applied to it. So this is one we could apply in that case where we didn't have you know equal variances in the levels of our different independent factor like stop. Um, I haven't tested this. We'll see what happens on the fly here. Uh, but if we set the variance equal to be true, do we get the exact same result as we got at the beginning? We'll find out. Uh, yeah, we do. Look at that. So 15.11 uh, is our F value for the original analysis. And it winds up being just a different way to run that same one way ANOVA we had at the beginning. So that's kind of cool. Uh, and hopefully that gives you a little more confidence that what you're doing here has some sort of analytical uh, validity because, you know, the only thing we're changing here is this sort of parameter in the syntax of the command. Okay. So, and then you might notice as well, like we saw with the Welch correction for t-tests that the degrees of freedom go from being something nice and, you know, whole numbered to <laughs> something with decimal points after, uh, you know, the integers. So it's a little bit messier here based on however they're calculating degrees of freedom. But again, we're beyond the point of worrying about that because I think we understand, understand basically how the sort of testing paradigm works. And so we're just gonna say, this is one other test you can apply to data that look like this. And then we'll move on because there's a lot more to learn still by the time we get to the end of the semester. All right, so onwards, further up and further in. Um, I will say that uh, this and the Kruskal-Wallis test are both pretty simple fixes, but they only apply to one-way analysis, unfortunately. Um, so one sort of approach we can use when you have more than one independent factor in your analysis is called the repeated measures ANOVA. Uh, and this is uh, another approach you can use or should use really when you know that not all of your observations are independent from one another. Uh, so when you're kind of getting as the name implies, repeated measures for the same sort of factor or combination of factors. Um, so yeah, exactly. This is a repeated measures ANOVA and it comes into play when you have more than one observation from a particular factor or combination of factors in your analysis. So they're not entirely independent from one another. Like uh, the example I can draw on here is uh, when, you, when we all produced uh, stops for our VOT data set, I had you guys repeat um, each individual word three times. So we're getting repeat, repeated measures for the VOT of a particular stop in a particular word like peel or keel or pale or whatever, right? Um, so those measures should not be entirely independent from each other because they're repetitions of the same thing over and over again. We just happen to get three in that particular case. Um, so that's sort of the most likely scenario in which you would be applying this sort of testing paradigm where you're getting multiple observations on a particular stimulus type from these subjects in your experiment. Uh, and you can, again, this is something you kind of have to think about as you're designing your study. Uh, like if I'm going to do this, uh, I can sort of, you know, if I'm going to have people repeat words multiple times, so I measure VOT or F0 or whatever in them, then I can apply repeated measures ANOVA to the data I get out of that. You just have to know what the heck it means to apply a repeated measures ANOVA. So uh, in this case, each subject is going to exhibit their own characteristic residual variance across the multiple observations. Rather than uh, some sort of uniform or general random residual variance we normally assume to underlie an ANOVA. So I think I mentioned this just a few slides ago, but normally in ANOVA, that residual variance is kind of supposed to be the unpredictable part of the variance in your, the overall variance in your data. Uh, and this model is basically saying, well, you know, some of that residual variance is predictable uh, and we can predict it if we're getting multiple measures from each subject. So it's assuming, uh, or it's going to, yeah, it's, this is, I guess, part of the assumption of repeated measures ANOVA is that it's assuming that like uh, different subjects are going to have their own sort of characteristic variance. Uh, and if they do have their own characteristic residual variance, you can use that to sort of predict to a certain extent the overall underlying residual variance you get in um, your analysis of variance. So that what used to be before what used to be before is just this completely random residual variance has a little less randomness in it because <clears throat> we're attributing some of that variance to uh, differences between speakers, basically. Um, that's kind of what it looks like conceptually, but what we're actually gonna do mathematically is treat that speaker-based variance as an error term in the analysis. So um, 
isn't that a little funny? You'll see what I mean here in a second. But basically, the errors in our predictions are not simply based on randomness overall. They're based on whoever is speaking. So that's how we're going to run our F-test. We're going to divide the sort of predictable variance by, say, the subject by subject variance in the denominator part of the equation. And in order to do this, you need multiple observations from each, each subject uh, so that you can calculate this new form of baseline variance. Um, and I kind of, I, I wanted to open this up before um, we actually walked through this lecture, but um, yeah, so I think this is the wrong example. I wanted to get the two-way example. Yeah, so sorry for the um, pause here, but I wanted to kind of just give you a sense of how this would work going back to this sort of two-way ANOVA um, that we had for Duchamp's data, right? So because in this case, um, there were, whoops, not what I wanted. Um, there were three repetitions. I want this crazy little graph. Um, so, right, um, at the end of it, um, if you remember in this two-way ANOVA, we calculate the residual variance by looking at how much um, difference there is between what we can get uh, as a prediction out of this complicated model and the individual data points. Uh, and for these uh, productions, these are Duchamp's three productions of coup. Uh, and you can see that there's still a little bit of variance left over here. Um, yeah, so I haven't looked at what other people did for their coup productions. Uh, cool, I guess was the word. Uh, but their variance might look a lot different from Duchamp's, there might be a lot more. There's Duchamp doesn't have a whole lot of variance here, but uh, some other speakers might have more consistent productions, that sort of thing. Instead of sort of attributing this leftover variance around this orange line as just complete randomness, we'll say this is how Duchamp does it, um, which is to say there's not a whole lot of variance here. And we'll see what we can kind of get out of um, our overall um, analysis by using that as the baseline or denominator variance uh, in our F test. So uh, hopefully that wasn't a waste of time for you guys to see that. Uh, I'll show you also what the sort of mathematical side of this looks like. But um, we uh, this first command, which I guess I'll run again, just so we can have a clean slate here to begin with. Uh, but this is our command for just the regular one-way ANOVA. And what I'm gonna look at here is how does VOT depend on stop place of articulation, which we've seen four times already today. Uh, but we'll compare that to a one-way ANOVA where we test if VOT differs from speaker to speaker. Um, and I say here that it would be weird to test this because, well, number one, we normally expect VOT to differ at least a little bit from speaker to speaker but also kind of for that reason, we don't really care that much uh, if VOT is depending on who's speaking. Uh, normally in linguistics, we think about other sort of more abstract sort of variables which might be affecting a linguistic measure like VOT. Um, that being said, like when we actually listen to people speak, uh, you know, you have to figure out what a particular speaker is doing in order to understand them. So in the real world of, you know, speech perception, uh, that is an important, variable in the equation. Uh, for now, um, we'll just look at this as a, po a possible additional main effect in this analysis and also as a possible interaction with stop place of articulation. Um, we saw this with Duchamp's uh, coup, coup, if we go back to that slide, where there seemed to be uh, a pretty reliable coup interaction factor where um, the coup um, VOT was a lot lower than we expect it to be just by the main effects alone. Uh, if we actually run this, we get a significant effect for everything. Um, yeah, there's a significant effect for speaker. Uh, and yeah, there's a, a what seems to be a significant um, speaker uh, in stop interaction as well. Uh, so, right, the only problem with this is that um, it's kind of hard to interpret this because we have 13 different speakers in our data set. So, right, yeah, they differ from each other, but what exactly does that tell us? Uh, we'll run it a different way for the repeated measures ANOVA, and I'll make this a little bit bigger so that you can hopefully see it better. Uh, but what we're gonna do for repeated measures is convert that speaker-based variance into our error variance. Um, and we're gonna do it by using this syntax. Uh, 
Uh, so we're going to change the model where VOT is the dependent measure. And we're just going to say that stop is the only independent factor. And then speaker is going to be part of this error term in the repeated measures in NOVA. I think it would be easier if I show it here. So we're going to kind of go back to this original model where stop is our only independent factor. And it's the only one we care about in terms of whether we can make predictions of VOT based on its different factor levels. Uh, but in addition to that, we're adding this error term. Uh, and this is the part uh, of our syntax where I feel like it's not really that helpful, at least the way it's laid out here. Uh, because what's saying here is this is the error. So up here in this model, this is our error term. It was called residuals. And you might recall that we divide this mean square value by this mean square value to get that F value. Uh, that's how we're comparing variances. And in this model, though, we're going to replace that residual term with this, whatever the heck this means. Uh, and the part that uh, I get annoyed by here is that it, it looks like you're taking speaker variance and dividing it by stop variance, but you're actually going to wind up doing the exact opposite of that and dividing the stop variance by the speaker variance. Um, where the speaker variance functions as your error term. So I've talked a lot about this. I'll just hit return so you can see it. Um, and maybe I'll expand this a bit so you can see it better as well. Okay, sorry about that. I got all choked up as I was walking you through the results of this initial repeated measures ANOVA. Um, but what I wanted to show you uh, was that in this case where we have this two-way ANOVA with both factors and also the interaction. Um, the reason I ran that is because it shows you where all the different variances come from that are relevant in this repeated measure ANOVA. So yeah, like I said before, the way our approaches repeated measures ANOVA is, I feel, not that easy to understand, unfortunately. Uh, it could be done perhaps a little bit more gracefully. This is a really nice output of all the sort of information you need to know about how this ANOVA works. Um, and then you kind of have to decipher what's going on here. Uh, and it kind of helps to be able to decipher it if you can see this information as well. So what we're going to look at kind of crucially here is, um, well, first of all, this initial sort of error speaker term, why it's phrased that way, I don't know exactly why. Uh, but the residuals, this information comes from here. Uh, hopefully you can see that. Uh, that's just the speaker term by itself, but it's not being treated as a potential independent factor in this analysis. It's just considered residual variance. Um, and so when we actually run the relevant F-test for um, this part of the model here in repeated measures ANOVA, what we do is uh, take this stop factor, and these numbers are exactly what you see up here for this stop factor. And then you consider the residual variance to be what was the interaction term up here in this ANOVA. So you, instead of dividing this number by this number to get this F value for the stop factor, as we did before, what we're going to do is divide this mean square value by this mean square value and get this F value for the repeated measures ANOVA. Um, we have a lot of observations here uh, and a lot of different speakers, so it's not super surprising that we get a significant um, p-value for this. And also stop does, generally speaking, have an effect on VOT. Uh, stop place does have an effect on VOT. We know that by now. Um, so yeah, that you know is significant, but this f-value winds up being a little bit smaller um, because we can kind of uh, suck up more variance by looking at uh, the different speakers than we can just by assuming it's all random. Um, as we did up here. So uh, that's how the repeated measures ANOVA basically does its math. There's not a whole lot we need to learn there that's new. We're just kind of dividing two different terms that we haven't divided before um, in order to get this F value. But otherwise the mechanics are basically the same. Um, so that's what I'm saying down here in this part of the slide. Uh, and like I said before as well, with regards to the syntax, I feel like this is confusing because as you can see down here, you're dividing the stop um, mean square divided by uh, the stop by speaker mean square. So it's weird to express that like this, but that's how R does it. Uh, this is actually the one point at which I will kind of throw in the towel a bit. 
and say that having learned SPSS uh, as a grad student back in the day, I think there's one thing that SPSS does better than or more clearly than R does. But uh, we're sticking with this for now because R does so well in so many other different domains. Um, I just have to explain to you how it works. Uh, yeah, so we can also run a two-way ANOVA to remind ourselves that vowel did not have a significant effect on VOT. Um, so I'll show that to you <clears throat> and also show you how this can kind of potentially matter to your analysis. So this is looking at a two-way ANOVA with, where stop and vowel are both the factors um, and VOT is the dependent measure. And we get a significant effect for stop over here. Uh, but vowel does not matter, nor does the interaction between the two. Uh, but remember, um, when um, we uh, run a repeated measures ANOVA, we're going to change what our residual variance looks like, and we might get a different result for that reason. And this is actually one case where that happens. Um, so in this case, I'll uh, also show you how you can run kind of a repeated measures ANOVA, where you have two different, you know, for a two-way ANOVA. So up here is just a one-way ANOVA, repeated measures. Uh, down here, we're going to run it with a two-way ANOVA, so stop by vowel. Uh, and then you put both of those factors in here um, in the denominator, what looks like the denominator of this error term. Um, so <clears throat> this is, we're just collecting variance by speaker here because we have 13 different speakers. And we're considering both independent factors when we do that. So if we hit return, in this particular case, maybe I'll move it back down again, um, we still get this significant effect for stop place of articulation. Uh, and um, our variance is going to wind up looking a little bit different here. Uh, it's kind of funny how this plays out because we get the same mean square values um, for our F calculation in the two-way ANOVA as we got before. So it's still dividing just um, stop basically by speaker and stop by that interaction to calculate that F value. Uh, it will do the same thing for speaker and or for vowel for the main effect of vowel divide that by the interaction of speaker and vowel. Uh, but for the stop vowel interaction, it's going to take a look at something we haven't um, played around with specifically before, which is the potential speaker by stop by vowel interaction. Um, so in this case, we divide this mean square, which we saw up here, uh, by this, well, here it's considered a residual error term, but it's the whole interaction of these three guys. And when we do that, we get this F value, which is big enough to give us a significant effect. So this is basically saying that um, when we do, uh, when we do a repeated measures ANOVA for both stop and vowel as a, uh, two factors in the two-way in ANOVA, uh, we get a significant effect for stop, and then we also get a significant interaction for stop and vowel. And in case that wasn't clear before, I might as well just throw that in there. Um, so if we were to run sort of regular ANOVA with, um, actually, sorry, this is where it breaks. Sorry. Uh, right. Um, oops. Yeah, so uh, just to specify where that residual variance comes from, um, this is the same number here and here. Uh, so that we're just dividing the stop vowel interaction term by the stop speaker vowel interaction term uh, to get our F value in this repeated measures ANOVA. And that winds up being a significant P value. Um, okay, so we have two significant effects here. We understand this one pretty well. What is the stop vowel? by vowel interaction look like. Um, we kind of had a clue that something like this might exist when we were looking at Duchamp's data for the two-way ANOVA example back uh, a couple lectures ago because we did have that sort of apparent coup effect uh, where VOT went down um, when he was producing coups for some reason. Uh, I don't think Duchamp's that much of a revolutionary, but you know, people might surprise you. Anyways, um, <clears throat> let's take a look at this interaction in a box plot. And this is our interaction. Uh, we're supposed to figure out what story this is telling us. You can take a look at it and let me know what you think. But just by eyeballing it here, I'd say this looks pretty complicated. Um, so yeah, sometimes you're up, sometimes you're down. How can we figure out how to make sense of this? Um, I can uh, go back to some of the tricks I taught you last time for running 
post hoc tests, uh, we can start out by looking at this Tukey HSD test, which is pretty easy to run. Uh, and this is just kind of looking at the basic uh, model here, where we just have the two factors. We're not worrying about sort of factoring out speaker variance when we run the um, or post hoc test for the repeated measures ANOVA. I'll have something to say about that in a second, though. But if we run that Tukey HSD command, uh, well, it turns out we get, you know, the comparisons we'd expect for the stops, and then we get the comparisons we'd expect for the vowels. There's five vowels, right? So there's a lot of different sort of comparisons we have to make there. Four, three, two, one, ten, all together. I'm not going to count them all up for the stop-vowel interaction, but you get a lot of different post hoc tests here uh, with a lot of numbers, um, enough numbers to choke a nose tackle, as it says on the back of my football encyclopedia. Uh, yeah, so hopefully this doesn't choke you as you're trying to do your analysis, but you have to sort of make sense. Like, we know this is a significant interaction. How is it significant? What is it telling us? Um, and even just poking through here, it's like, do we even get any significant results for these tests? Well, okay, here's one. Like, pay versus ka, that's different somehow. So just based on, like, this number, they're negative, so it looks like ka is bigger than pay. It's like, okay, there's a start. Um, but this is hard, right? Because like pay, when you're comparing pay and ka, like both the stop and the vowel differ here. So it's hard to know if that means anything. Um, can we find any other significant p values in here? Anything less than point of, oh, here's one. Oh, look at that. Pay and k. Okay. So before we had pay and ka, now pay and k are different. Hmm. Okay. We're still a lot further to go. Oh, this says that key and pay are different. So pay is, is kind of consistently coming up here, but it's hard to find in all these results. Oh, here's another one, ku and pay, so on and so forth. Well, um, I'm not going to bo bore you with all those details, but just hopefully you get the idea that it's not easy to do that um, just by looking at the results of however many 45 different Tukey tests. Uh, so um, we're going to simplify things by splitting our data up into just three subgroups. Um, and I'm just going to focus on doing this by our, what I want to, the point I wanted to make or make sure I get across before I made sure I got across before is that it's hard to know how to interpret any of the comparisons where the levels differ in both factors in both stops and vowels. So it's, it would be easier if we could just say, oh, if I keep like stop place of articulation constant, how does vowel affect the VOT I get um, in that particular circumstance. Or you could do it the other way and say, if I keep the vowel constant, uh, how does changing the stop place of articulation affect VOT? Uh, so what we want to do is just focus on comparisons where only one factor differs between the two samples. Um, and you can kind of treat those as like planned comparisons, as I mentioned before, because if you get those significant results between like pay and ka, it's like, okay, that those differ, but like, all right, two things change and one dependent measure changes. So it's what story to tell from that. So uh, I can also say that you can look at the repeated measures in NOVA as an expansion of a paired samples t-test uh, because uh, basically if you're looking at uh, sort of how the combination of factors differs with like repeated measures, you're just kind of changing one factor uh, between your different levels of your group. So you can kind of think of that as like a paired expansion of a paired samples t-test, as is mentioned multiple times in the textbook. So we'll use paired samples t-tests here where we can, which will help us, you know, kind of maximize our statistical power, hopefully. Um, but before we do that, we need to kind of group these, this data into separate subgroups for each place of articulation. This is, I think, going to be the easiest way to do this. And then I'll run pairwise t-tests for within each place of articulation. So uh, I think I was in the midst of mentioning this before, but you can kind of think of this as planned comparisons. So rather than uh, doing all these t-tests or two key tests, whatever, uh, for every single pairing of the two possible combinations of the factors, I'm only going to look at those subsets where just one factor differs between the two terms. Um, so something like pa versus ka, where the only thing that differs is the place of articulation. Uh, but in actual actuality, what I'm going to run here um, are only the t-tests where the vowel differs and the stop always remains the same. Uh, so I know, like in this case, it's not 
a significant difference. But if I were to get a significant difference here, I could attribute it to the vowel. And I'd say, well, just within this context of you know, producing a P, then maybe E can change the VOT uh, in comparison to AH somehow. So that's what I'm going to do by running these pairwise t-tests. Uh, I'm going to make them paired samples t-tests. Uh, I'm going to use the home correction to kind of make things work in my favor, hopefully maximally. And I'm just going to see um, how VOT depends on vowel within that subset of P stops. <clears throat> and what I see here, again, I'm, I'm still getting 10 different post hoc tests. That's a lot, but not many of these are significant. So I have a difference here between A and A. Uh, I have a difference here between A and O. Uh, I have a difference here between A and U as well. So A, that pay combination is doing something funny. Uh, we've seen that before already. Uh, and then I get one other little stray uh, significant result here between E and U. Um, Okay, so that's something that's a little bit more of an, a story I can tell that while well, pay, for some reason, pale gives me a specific kind of VOT that's different from the others. I can do the same thing with the T's. And in this case, this also simplifies my life a little bit because I'm not getting uh, any significant results there. So I basically have nothing to explain. It's basically, you know, for all the vowels, you're gonna get a consistent VOT when you produce a T. Uh, and then lastly, I can do it with a K or the K data. Uh, and here I just get uh, a couple of significant results. So K versus key, these two guys, and then key versus co, those two guys. So unfortunately we didn't get anything meaningful with this coup, so there is no coup interaction. Oh well, hopefully there's no coups either, but that's a subject for political science, I guess and other bad jokes. Um, but anyways, uh, we just have a couple of minor little things, um, mostly seemingly focusing around E, uh, key, uh, maybe because the place of articulation of that K is a little bit further forward. Uh, that might be one reason why you're getting sort of a different VOT for it. Um, yeah, so the last bit of this sort of interpretive exercise is that uh, you can plot box plots for these guys to kind of get a sense of what story they're telling you. So for the P, <clears throat> the one that stood out was the A, so this guy right here. And you can see when you plot this out that A is low. Uh, so for some reason, pay, pale, we're getting lower VOT than for most of these other vowels. And I think there was one little effect for E here, so like E versus U. Um, that doesn't jump out quite obviously in the graph, but you know, the median U is the highest here and then E is kind of the second lowest. So and there's also this long tail at the bottom. So maybe E is a little bit lower than U, but at least we can kind of get a sense of what's going on there. Um, we saw for T, really there's nothing going on. We can box plot it out uh, to see what that tells us, but it should show, yeah, these are all basically the same. Uh, and then lastly, uh, maybe we'll see a different value for the keys here. Um, yeah, this is actually a little bit different than I thought. Uh, so it looks like E is kind of on the high end here. So key, uh, normally expect further forward place of articulation to have less VOT, but here it seems to have a little bit more. But so there's a little bit of surprise. That's always why you run an experiment is to find where the surprises are because if you're just stuck in your head, uh, it's not a good place to find reality. Okay, so um, <clears throat> yeah, I've got a very basic summary of the story here. Um, it looks like E and A induce shorter VOTs for P than the other stops, and VOT is longer for E than A for the K stops. But the moral of the story overall is that this is still a complicated interaction. There's a lot of comparisons you have to make, even when you focus on just like the one-dimensional differences. Uh, but with a little bit of effort and strategy, you can reduce the amount of post-hoc work you have to do to figure out what it's saying. Um, and again, this is something you should consider when you're designing your study uh, to try to sort of prevent yourself from having to do a huge amount of work at the back end after you've collected your data. It's like always tempting to say, oh, I want to find out if this makes a difference on whatever measure or if this factor makes a difference. And then we can throw them together and see if there's interaction. Like it's tempting to find want to find out everything all at once, uh, but it can become a real headache when you actually run the stats at the end. So try to simplify the structure of your experiment in a way that it helps you make clear what you know actually does matter in your data. And so you can make comparisons simply uh, and convincingly when you kind of have to tell the story after the fact. Okay, that's all I'm gonna say about that. For now, that's just kind of like 
a pragmatic sort of um, th tool to have at your disposal uh, in terms of experimental design and these specific tricks for interpreting post hoc results. For now, we need to get on to the last topic for repeated measures ANOVA, which is the concept of between subjects factors. So for this, I'm going to load up a new data set. Um, <clears throat> this is from a former MA student, uh, Mingyu Chu, uh, who completed her MA um, in our program a couple of years ago. Uh, and she had a really cool study, um, which was looking at whether a speaker's pitch range and pitch level depend on the language that they're speaking. Uh, so kind of the context of this is that she was a um, native Mandarin speaker from Northeastern China, uh, and she had learned English, which is part of what enabled her to come to Calgary to study, but she also knew Japanese as a second language. Uh, and there's kind of this notion that people have, it's actually been studied uh, in a number of uh, different um, research projects over the years, but there's a notion people have that when um, Japanese speakers are speaking Japanese, it, sometimes it seems like they have a higher F0 than when they're speaking English. Uh, and in particular, people think that Japanese women uh, might have a higher F0 when they're speaking Japanese than when they're speaking English. Uh, so uh, she took a look at all the background literature on this and noticed that there's a lot of different factors at play here. Uh, so what she did uh, to kind of test this hypothesis is that she looked at native speakers of English and Japanese speaking both English and Japanese. Uh, so it's kind of like a two-way design here. Uh, there's a question of whether or not maybe your native language might matter in this equation, also whether the language you're speaking might matter. Um, so what did she do? Um, she looked at a number of other interesting variables that she thought might affect pitch level and pitch range. And this is another case where it's like, oh, let's just throw this in uh, and see if it matters. Uh, and maybe it will, who knows, but it's going to make our stats complicated in the end. Uh, so what she looked at as well was L2 proficiency. So these were, you know, native Japanese speakers who had learned English and vice versa. Some were better than others, so they rated themselves from one to five. Um, she also looked at different sentence types, uh, so which can be expected to induce different sort of intonational patterns to kind of get a broader sort of picture of what kind of pitch range they might be using. So things like statements, echo questions, yes, no questions, WH questions, and alternative questions. If you've taken my 441 class, those should probably look familiar. But she was having <clears throat> her subjects basically read these um, different statements and questions. She also had a condition where they listened to somebody else say it and then they repeated what they heard, uh, which was kind of interesting. But I, there's already enough in here for us to worry about, so I won't talk about that too much. But she had two speakers of both languages. Actually, I think she had more than two speakers. Uh, so I'm going to eliminate that. So she had speakers of both languages produce two repetitions of five sentences of each type. Um, and then she extracted a number of pitch measures from each production. So the minimum F0, the maximum F0, and then from the, that you can calculate a range. And then she also calculated the mean and the median F0 within each production. All right. So the part here that is going to help us out is the fact that we have two repetitions of each sentence. So we can apply repeated measures at sort of the most primal level there because we do have at least two repetitions gives us some sort of residual variance to work with. Uh, and then we'll focus on the median F0 value uh, and see if that changes. So this is kind of considering pitch level. Um, there's also a separate issue of does pitch range change between languages when um, people are speaking Japanese and English. But for now, we'll just say, does anybody, you know, do people consistently raise or lower their um, F0 when they're speaking one language or another? So to answer the big question of does the language they're speaking matter, actually, maybe I'll just show you the summary of this data. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so these are all the different factors, speaker, gender, their native language, and then the language they're speaking. Uh, and then we have all these different dependent measures, and the one we care about is the median here. Uh, so to run the basic analysis, does F0 median depend on the language you're speaking, uh, we can run that one way ANOVA and say, well, no, it doesn't seem to. Uh, we know we have a probability of greater than 0.05 there, so language doesn't seem to be a significant factor. But um, we're kind of glossing over 
a lot of details by doing that. Um, for instance, we know that speaker gender has an effect on F0. So uh, we have both male and female speakers in here. Actually, I think I might load this up so you can see what the data look like or looks like. Uh, yeah, so here's all our different speakers um, over here on this side here. We've got female speakers, their native speaker language might be Japanese, it might be speaking English, um, this is their L2 proficiency, so on and so forth. Uh, right, so there are both female and male speakers in this database. Here, speaker 10 is male. Um, we know that can have an effect. So maybe uh, we should consider that when figuring out whether language has an effect too, um, because there's a whole bunch of variants that we can sort of factor out that's based on gender alone. And also, as I mentioned here, potentially um, a speaker's native language might affect like your F0 as well. Um, so we should kind of consider that in our analysis before we just assume that language doesn't matter. Um, the tricky part is that not all of the subjects can produce data for all the possible factor interactions. Uh, and then hopefully this will be obvious, but you know, um, your gender and your native language are just something built in. You can't just tweak those between experimental conditions. So those <clears throat> are between subjects factors. Uh, so no subject in this experiment takes on the values of both levels for those factors. So no subject here is gonna be both male and female, and no subject is gonna be both a native speaker of Japanese and a native speaker of English. So we can take that into account by just kind of splitting up the data into those two groups, the subjects in the data set are split into two halves by both of those factors. So actually they're gonna wind up being uh, split into four groups because we have like the female and Japanese speakers and the male Japanese speakers, so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> we can compare those though with a within, within subjects factor like language, where all subjects produce an equal number of sentences in both English and Japanese. So this is a distinction which you may have heard about already. And if you keep going with linguistics, you'll probably hear about again, but a between subject factor is one where no subject can take on both levels of those factors. Uh, so if you are a native speaker of English, that's what you are for this experiment. And you're gonna be in a different group from the native speakers of Japanese. Uh, but with a within subjects factor, that's just, you know, more about how the trials are, uh, structured rather than how the subjects are, uh, are structured. So you can have a particular speaker in this experiment produce an equal number of sentences in both languages, and therefore language becomes a within subjects factor. So within any given participant, uh, you can make that sort of comparison. But you can't make that sort of comparison within an individual subject when you're saying, uh, give me the native Japanese side of you versus the native English side of you, that sort of thing, right? So how do we deal with this sort of distinction in our factors for repeated measures ANOVA? Um, it's, this is where the R syntax kind of gets really hairy uh, and I really don't like it, uh, but uh, we're gonna have to work with it as it is. So here's how you would run this ANOVA with not just language as an independent factor, but also um, gender and native language as a factor. Uh, and we're gonna run it as a repeated measures ANOVA, so there's gonna be an error term in here. Um, but inside this error term, the only independent factor I have is language. And unfortunately, this is how uh, between subjects factors get specified in our syntax is by omission. So uh, we have these three factors here in our model, but only one of them is here. And the only one of them that is in this error term is the within subjects factor language. Uh, so this is the one case where SPSS has it way better, does this way better than R because in the SPSS model, you say, okay, this factor is between subjects, this factor is within subjects, and it's very clear. In this case, you're just making gender and native language between subjects factors by leaving them out of this part right here, which is easy for people to miss. Um, yeah, so the reason we can include uh, language 
in that error term um, is because it's possible to calculate variance for repetitions from both levels in that factor for each subject. Uh, so each subject will give you two repetitions for whatever, uh, at least two repetitions for every sort of factor combination there. Um, but you can't get, you know, the different levels for each subject for the between subjects factors. Uh, so they're left out of the error term in the model. So it's easy to miss that fact. So I'm trying to dwell on it right now so that you can see it quite clearly. But these are between subjects factors because they are not in the error term. And that's the only difference. Because this one is in the error term, it's a within subjects factor. I'm going to hit return now so you can see the results of this. And so I can stop talking about this minor but important detail. Uh, and we can see the results we get here. And it turns out, if we run this analysis, that language still doesn't matter. Um, we're not getting a significant effect for what language people are speaking. But we do get a significant effect for gender, which is not surprising. Uh, we know that F0 depends on whether you're a male or female. So, okay, great. That's reassuring. Uh, there's also this significant effect of native language, which is kind of interesting. It's not as uh, big of an effect as the gender effect, but it's there. Um, and I've kind of often wondered about this, uh, like why would it make a difference uh, what your native language is? Um, and one possibility that comes to mind, which I don't think we tested for directly in this study, but uh, it's possible that one group of subjects might be uh, might have a consistently higher F0 than another, simply if that one other group of subjects is uh, smaller as a group of people than the uh, other group of subjects. So if, say, the um, Japanese speakers here were consistently shorter than uh, the native English-speaking subjects, you might expect them to have a consistently higher F0. Uh, that might be one reason why this is happening. Um, because otherwise, if that's not the case, it's not something sort of biological or structural like that, uh, you'd have to sort of appeal to, well, for some reason, like this one group of speakers just tends to speak higher than the others, just for maybe cultural or possibly linguistic reasons. But be that as it may, we can't get into that those results so much. It's just kind of an interesting finding from that study. Uh, it's also interesting that language doesn't seem to matter, uh, at least for that group of subjects, uh, that when they switch languages, that just, they have their F0 and they don't, sort of recalibrate for Japanese versus English or what have you. Uh, but moving on for the more statistical side of this uh, lecture, I'll let you know that there are assumptions behind repeated measures ANOVA as well, just like we had assumptions behind regular ANOVA. And these will probably look familiar. Uh, number one, the dependent variable is normally distributed in each level of the within subjects factors. We've kind of seen that before. Uh, and then also that there are equal variances across the levels of the within subjects factors, like language in that previous analysis that we just did. Okay, so again, I'm relying on other people's expertise and kind of giving you recommendations about how to deal with this sort of thing. But the first of these assumptions becomes less problematic with large sample sizes of greater than or equal to 30. Uh, but otherwise, you need to take into account uh, when a distribution is heavily skewed in one direction or another for this first assumption about normal distribution of the dependent variable. Um, however, be that as it may, a repeated measures ANOVA is also pretty robust to violations of this assumption when the number of observations in each factor level is balanced. Uh, so we don't have to worry about that one too much if you design your study well. The other one, the other assumption about equal variances across the levels of a within subjects factor um, is an assumption known as sphericity, uh, which is kind of a fun word to say, uh, but it's also kind of a bigger deal when you're running a repeated measures ANOVA. Um, and you can actually test it um, with a test known as Mockley's test of sphericity. <clears throat> and the last time that um, I taught this class, I went to some length to find out exactly how to test for sphericity in R. And that's where R really gets hairy uh, and does not work in an easy uh, to process manner. So I'm actually gonna, gonna say here that this is very important and we're gonna skip how to deal with it um, because it's gonna take up too much of our time uh, and we have a limited amount of time left in the semester. So uh, just know that it's out there and that if sphericity is violated in your data set, then you can use corrections for the p-values of the analysis that are called the greenhouse geyser or when felt corrections. Uh, and they would sort of apply kind of like a, a Bonferroni or a home correction would uh, in a post hoc analysis.
Um, so there are ways around. <coughs> sorry, <coughs> there are ways around uh, this problem. Uh, and like I said before, testing for sphericity in R is so complicated, it's not worth spending our time on right now. But I will say that um, you can avoid this problem uh, by working with what are called linear mixed effects models, uh, which take the subject by subject differences and variances in variance into account when building a model, rather than just assuming that that variance is always the same across subjects. Uh, so it's kind of um, doing what we're already doing with repeated measures ANOVA, uh, but taking it another step further in a linear mixed effects model, um, the model will develop sort of a linear model for each subject's variance to kind of try to get more predictability out of that variance um, or as much predictability, predictability out of that variance as it can. Um, so that is actually quite a popular method for people to use now. Uh, and hopefully you can see why or where that's coming from. Um, I don't want to address it right away. Uh, I'll just say that if you are, if you have gone to conferences or listened to people's talks, uh, it's commonly, they will commonly present the results of these sorts of models. Uh, so you know why it's relevant, hopefully. And uh, if you don't, I'll just say it's super helpful and currently popular. But in order to understand how it works, uh, we need to learn a little bit more about those chi-squared models that I told you before. And also how to run significance tests for dependent variables, which are categorical rather than gradient, which we really haven't done at all so far. So I want to focus on that uh, for the next couple of weeks. And then we'll circle back around to sort of wrapping up the course with these um, more complicated, more sophisticated, and more helpful models um, by the time we're done. And by the time I send you on your way. So to get into um, the fun stuff of chi-squared models and testing uh, for dependent variables, which are categorical, Rather than gradient, we're gonna start rolling some dice. So you can look forward to that at the beginning of our next lecture. Uh, and for now, I'm gonna say goodbye and say I hope you enjoyed ANOVA, but we'll be moving on next time. See you then.